Welcome to Vivid Talk Live. I'm your host, Gwen Witherspoon. I'm the principal and chief visionary officer of Adam Red and Atlanta Branding Agency. I'm a brand strategist and a better life coach. Vivid Talk Live is all about your personal and professional development. I am here to help you learn a fresh way of thinking and doing for all you were designed to build. I'm streaming live to Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope. You can watch the stream from those channels and on my website at GwenWitherspoon.com. Replays are available there as well as on IGTV and Twitter. Make sure you follow your favorite channels so you'll receive notifications when I go live. Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now, two weeks ago, I shared five unique brand personas. I'll remind you of those when we get started because no matter the category you fit into, each one has its own set of sub brands or products that you need to develop. So we're going to continue talking about engineering your corporate DNA that we started last week, only tonight's focus is going to be on answering the question, how are you going to get it done? Because you were born to produce. Please introduce yourself in, your, in the comments. Your questions are welcome. Katrina and Ron are helping me monitor the chat. 
Thank you so much for joining. Please share the link with your friends, invite them, tell them about the replays. We'll get right into it after this. So don't forget to follow at Gwen Fuchsius on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Periscope, and Gwen with a Spoon Coach on YouTube. And my website is GwenWithaSpoon.com. I mentioned that you can watch the replays. You can get, that's also where you can just find out all the information about me. You can watch on live um, right from the website. You can see the replays from the week before on the homepage. And if you click this lovely button, watch more replays, you'll also see uh, the all the replays from every episode. You can shop the store. You can see all the uh, brands that I've, I've created, am creating, that I'm affiliated with to help you even more. And then you can also contact me and you can check all my social accounts. So there's no excuse you can find me. Um, so tonight, whew, tonight I think is going to be good. And I, I probably need to break this up into at least two episodes so we'll see how it goes but I, I'm I think I always start out thinking that I don't really have a whole lot to say and I'll like write down a few bullet points and then next thing you know it's almost an hour later hey Nedra hey Renee good to see you but yeah so almost an hour later then I go oh I talked forever so I kind of feel like I have a whole lot more to say like more bullet points that I'm starting with so I'm thinking this might need to be split up into some sections. So I, I need to make first a couple of connections. So two weeks ago, I talked about, um, I shared a couple of, let me see, what were my, I'm, I'm looking at my old replays here. The topic from two weeks ago was your gift is necessary. Your gift is necessary. And one of the things I covered was like five brand personas and they were thought leader, influencer personality i changed this one i think i can't remember exactly what i said it was scribe i was kind of playing with what what i would should call that one but later on i got some clarity so i'm going to call it curator and then advocate thought leader influencer personality curator and advocate okay and and just to refresh your memory or to introduce it to you if you weren't here um thought leader you have unique ideas and ways to communicate if you're an influencer, you are charismatic. People follow you. They they do what you say. Um, they want to be. They want to own what you. They want to wear what you wear. Eat what you eat. Uh, if you're a personality, you represent products well. Like you, it may not be you personally, your personal persona that you are sharing. You might just be a, a personality for a specific brand. Um, you know, you think about like T-Mobile and just different places, they'll have personalities. Now that personality, that may not be who they are in real life, but there is a personality that they are in, that they are, um, that they are, what? That they are sharing, that, that they are representing, right? To represent the product. And then curator, um, the curator is, you're, I, I, I kind of messed around with a bunch of words. I almost thought, I almost used historian. Um, I, I think last time I talked about being a scribe, but you are somebody that you are, you, you, you give history, you, you find information, you know, you pull together ideas. You are this quintessential, um, you're just a, a wealth of knowledge, right? And then an advocate, somebody that's always working on behalf of the disadvantaged or working on behalf just of a, of, of a specific cause. And what I was and so then so that's the first thing I want to I want to connect back to remember okay those first five those five personas then the last week I talked about engineering your corporate DNA right let me get back to my notes there real quick because I got them in a bunch of pages so I talked about I asked how will you be recognized how would you be recognized in a crowded marketplace so you think of those first five personas as 
you know, those are general categories. Clear. And, and last week, um, Renee talked about the fact that she felt like she was two of them. And, and I shared how you could have a primary and a secondary personality, right? Yeah, we laughed at scribe, didn't we? Because I, I knew it wasn't the right word, but it was all I could come up with at the time. But I, I think curator is much more accurate. Um, but, you know, in the historical sense, like you're gathering information these are the people, you know, like Bill, um, I was going to say Bill Gates, but, but um, Henry Louis Gates, who is, you know, doing our DNA history. Like he's do, he does all these specials around our heritage and, and the beginnings and the origins of things. Like he's such a wealth of knowledge. Ron and I are watching a series, um, you know, of all these historians telling us about ancient um ancient civilizations and the origins of things and where things came from. Political. I think political um, uh, p political commentators could kind of fit into that because they if you if they're they kind of operate in a historical vein, they're really kind of a curator. You think about a museum where we first got that where we first heard that term. It was in that museum sense. Right. So that's why I thought uh, curator is a more accurate term. But whether no matter how you where you feel like you fit in that what i talked about was how how are we how are you going to be recognized in a crowded marketplace and i talked about i introduced this concept of that i that i've been working with called um engineering your corporate dna and i talked about from a strategic standpoint how you need to start doing that but so tonight i kind of want to connect those two ideas and i think this is really a, a continuation of the um, engineering your corporate DNA idea. And um, let's see, I want to make sure I, I write notes for a reason. I should read them. Um, uh, so tonight, it's going to be about defining your brand architecture, which is, you know, a fancy branding agency, you know, branding principle, a, a, a fancy phrase that a principle of a branding agency would use, right? But what I want you to, when I think about branding or brand architecture, last week we talked about building, laying the foundation so that you can build. Well, if you, once the foundation is laid, you've got to create a structure, right? There's got to be a frame that you build on. I asked, have you ever seen a house without a frame? You just, you just, no, you have not. Um, but the house has a bunch of different rooms, right? It's not just one big open space unless it's a, unless it's a, fabulous loft, which I've always wanted to have. But typically, if you're building a house, even if you, if you live in a loft, oftentimes a loft is part of a bunch of other, you know, an, a, other loft structures as well. So or, or other loft spaces, and then they are all housed in a structure. So either way, it would, no matter how you look at it, you got to lay a foundation, then you got to create a frame, a structure. So brand architecture, I want you to think of it like that. Your brand architecture is the structure of your whole brand, you know, overall. And it's almost like rooms. You think, and and I want to talk about it tonight in terms of sub-brands. Defining your brand architecture is about figuring out what you're defining, what your brand, your sub-brands are, and then how they are uh, related to the to each other. How do they work together? Now, you you barely figured out what person that what persona that you fit into right and now i'm asking you to think about brand architecture but there's a method to my madness so hang on with me and um so because really the bottom line what i realized is no matter what person persona that you operate in you have to think of yourself as a brand right we, we started out this entire series talking about your personal branding and you have to think about yourself as a brand and think about it. There is no brand out there that does not have multiple products, multiple components, right? So, um, you know, what, when you, when, you know, my favorite, when you think of Apple, you, we think of computers, right? But Apple has the Air, the MacBook Air, they have the MacBook Pro, they have the iPad, they have, so this is part of their brand architecture. They have all these products that solve different problems or for different uses and different types of customers, right? And so you need to be thinking the same way, creating your own product. So I told you, I'm telling on myself every week when I come up with a topic, I typically just think to myself, okay, what, what am I going through this week? What am I dealing with? And, and it really comes from there. And so this week, 
uh, my team and I really for the last, well, the last, this week specifically, we were talking about um, a product that I have been developing since 2000, actually since the 90s, but officially created in 2011, my flip book, my flip productivity system. And so now we're working on uh, developing a, a really planning a flip workshop, flip productivity workshop for the end of this year that we're going to share with you and everybody. But it's really there was kind of a breakthrough in the conversation around the development of that product. And that has taken me down this rabbit hole hole where I am really expanding my own imagination and thinking around this product and all of the pieces that go with it, the accessories, all the things that go that um, that belong in it, and just giving myself the ability to imagine every possible thing that I could ever want it to be without limit, limiting myself to just what's on the market already or what I can already see or what somebody else says is possible or even that I think I may even be able to afford. I am stretching my imagination and what it's showing me is there are so many opportunities in front of me to provide, to create and provide products that really help you to become, you know, to, to, to have a fresh way of thinking and to give you the tools that you need to take action and to support your efforts. So I realized that's exactly what every, no matter what the brand persona is, that is the thing that we all need. We all need to develop our brand architecture, define what our products are, and and then we got to produce it, right? Because you were born to produce. Um, I talked, um, I think during that same two weeks ago when I was at, talking about how your gift is necessary, I talked about the fact that you are expected to take the gifts and talents and abilities that you have been given, that you have been granted. You are expected to increase what you've been given. So what better way to do that than with products and with, you know, just really defining how you are going to show up in the marketplace. And in order to do all of that, you have to figure out how you are going to get it done. Productivity is at the center, at the core of everything. And uh, and so this is a very appropriate topic for me to be discussing with you because I am always thinking about productivity and this my flip productivity system is for entrepreneurs to develop their own action plan for how they're actually going to make their vision happen how you're going to create everything that you are imagining in your head and you may have started on things and if you're like me <laughs> i'm a creative i've created a lot of things started them and maybe kind of got them out but not fully developed and so what we uh, what we have to do is we've got to challenge ourselves to to create our own deadlines to push ourselves to make ourselves get it done and the one thing in one of the steps one of the tools that I've created is a series of flip work worksheets that are available that I you know share them um, and use in my flip workshops and one of them is around um, it's around creating an action plan. It's a produce worksheet. So I'm going to kind of share with you the steps from that. So you you need to create an action plan so when, to answer this question. How are you going to get it done? You got to create an action plan around um, six areas. Your purpose, your people, your product, in plural, and, and product in the, in the global sense, in your profit. If you're like me, I, and every most of the entrepreneurs that I deal with, we have these great ideas and we'll start throwing money at those ideas without even having a plan for profit. And so we have to create an action plan for that. And then the last thing is we need an action plan for our process. Because if you have not defined a process for how you're going to actually distribute and get it, get it done and distribute it, then um, you're going to Find yourself creating a job instead of creating a company that serves you and a company, as I mentioned once before as well, a company that can can survive without you. And, you know, we should all be building our companies, as I talked about a while ago, um, as if we were going to sell it. And in order to do that, to get your company ready for sale, you have to set it up in a way that it functions without you. So but we got to create a plan for that. It's not going to just happen. Okay. So let's jump in. So 
with um and I, I I don't know I might get through this I might not if I don't we'll do we'll we'll do the um do the rest of it next week but purpose let's start there so you have to create an action plan for your purpose and most people when you ask them what's your purpose most of the time we can't answer it and I think I think there's a several reasons for that. And if you are in that situation, don't feel bad because we're all, we all do it. As soon as somebody says, ask you a direct question. So now exactly what it is that you're trying to accomplish. You know, sometimes we, you, you, we can find ourselves just rambling on and on and on about it. And what we need to do uh, is I want you to take the focus on your core business that you are creating. And then I want you to create, you have to have a mission statement. Now we've heard this a lot, but how often do we do it? But you got to create a mission statement, and the mission statement is really, you know, think about the word like mission and comp- mission uh, mission impossible. You know, your mission if you choose to accept it is so. Your mission needs to include what it is you were you, you really why you exist. Like what problem are you born to solve? Who are you trying to serve? What time frame? What's the the parameters, like what location, what area of, you know, what part, if, if you are your global brand, are you a local brand? Are you like, what is it? And you need, it needs to be a clear, succinct statement. Shouldn't be a long multi-sentence pop, you know, like this whole paragraph and uh, none of that. It needs to be really simple. My mission is right. Our, uh, we exist too. And, and make it really, 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 cl- re- really clear, Klimple. I was going to say clear and simple, Klimple. That will be our new word. Um, but you have to do that. And and I was in, I did a um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People um, workshop with Stephen Covey decades ago. And it was probably one of the best workshops I'd ever attended. And in that, we had an exercise for writing our mission statement. And, you know, we had to write several different versions of it. And that's what I want you to do. I don't want you to be satisfied. You write it down. You go, yeah, that's my mission statement. And you step away and keep going. I want you to write several versions and meditate on it and come back to it and look at it and then refine it so that you really feel like it reflects who you are share it with people ask for ask for input and then come up with what that clear mission statement is for your company right and and resist the urge to use just standard like professional language let your mission statement reflect the spirit of who you are the the spirit of the culture that you're trying to create for your company you know um, instead of uh, you know using words like quality and professionalism and you know enterprise and all the all the business buzzwords, just challenge yourself to be free and just to to speak talk talk the way you talk. Um, I mean, it's start there because remember your business. We talked about the corporate DNA and a corporate be, developing corporate. The word corporate is means body. Right. So and we talked about the fact that in as far as the U.S. government is concerned, a corporation corporation is considered an entity, a person all by itself. That's why you want to incorporate. So the the entity, the person that is your business is now responsible for the liability. You know, they're liable and not you personally. So it is a person, your corporation. Right. So if it is a person, then we want to. Um, we want to just treat it. We, we want to define its personality and all of that, right? So, you know, a person has a tone, they have an accent, they have a way of speaking, a way of communicating. So you want to, you want to share that. You want, you want your mission statement to reflect that the person the personage of your company, right? Then the other, the, the other um, issue is, you want to create a plan for your vision. And so purpose, purpose is the overarching idea and overarching, like that's the umbrella. And under that, you have your mission, vision, and values. And the way I like to talk about, really, I I put them in terms of statements, right? Vision statements. I think a lot of times people will take mission and they'll make a bunch of statements inside of that and call that their vision statement. And, you know, they mix it up. There's a bunch of different ways to approach it, but I typically like to have a clear, short, succinct mission statement because that's what it's called. Right. And then a series of vision statements, 
plural. I like to do it in threes, fives, sevens. I don't know why, but that feels better. But, and then, so in the vision statements, I think what you want to do is you want to describe, describe the experience that you're trying to create for your customer, for your client, right? So again, creating an action plan for your purpose includes writing a clear mission statement and then writing a series of vision statements that describe what it is. And, you know, it may be, what kind of experience do you want people to have with your product? What's the ultimate impact you want? I liked those to be like action statements. Um, you know, they are action oriented, right? Because these are, this is what we want to accomplish. And, and this is how we want people to experience. Like if, if your company is a person, what kind of relationship do you want to have with your, your, your customers and how do you want them to feel um, while they're working with you, you know? So um, your vision statements. And then the last is your values. Last thing under purpose is values because the values are the things, they're like the, they're the barometers. They help you. They're like those bumpers. Remember when, when we were little, we, we were too, too small to bowl down the whole lane. They put those bumpers in the, in the, what, in the gutters. So we wouldn't, so we, so we would hit the, um, hit the pins. So, um, your values are the thing that keep you in the center and keep you headed toward your mission because those they're the things that determine how you approach what you do they're the things that help you make decisions about what you what you're going to participate in and what you're going to say no to you know the, your values and i typically like to identify like three values you know um personally I value rhythm, revel revelation, and relationship. I'm I'm a poet. I love music. I love art. I love right, and and I I'm a thinker and a reader, and I love I love like learning and getting deep insights into ideas, and um and I love building with people. I love developing people. So and I'm not a real sentimental person, um, however relationships are super important to me because I, I just, I'm a champion for people and their dreams. I want to see them do the best they can. And I want to be involved in relationships with people who are helping me develop and be the best I can. I love to laugh. So I like really silly, smart, crazy, <laughs> funny people, right? So I love, I live my life like that. So those are values. So if I'm in a situation where I can't have any close relationships with people and there's no fun and there's no 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 rhythm and there's no beauty there's no creativity no energy Ugh. i don't want to be involved in that so those are values um in my every single one of my brands and my businesses i am i have three words that are the the thing that matter the most to me that i value and so every time i i do an event called the vivid party I'm long overdue for one, so we're probably going to do a virtual one at some point. But the Vivid Party, it, it's about celebrating all you were designed to be. And I purposely, I wanted the environment to be beautiful. I wanted the um, the experience, the food, everything about it to be special. I don't want, I didn't want to put out a vegetable tray and like you see the look on my face, <laughs> vegetable tray. I, I don't, I don't want to put out just a vegetable tray on some plastic and you know just slap it on a table and say here. I wanted you know everything about how the food was prepared, how it's presented. I wanted it on glass instead of plastic, and then eventually it was just simpler to get high quality plastic, right? Like clear, it had to be it, the, the theme, how it looked, how you felt when you walked through the door, all those things mattered. So you have to determine what are your three core values that your business is built on, that your business operates by, okay? So creating an action plan for your purpose includes defining your mission, vision, and values. So then the next thing is creating an action plan for people. And here there are, I've got four things. Um, and really, let me go back to, so this is, this is the sheet. You're probably not going to be able to see it too well, but this is the worksheet. So, and at some point, like if you participate in the workshop in the future, you'll get one of these and, and I'll walk you through how to use it. 
But um, you want to think about, you got to create an action plan in these six areas and you need to think about your team and you want to think about your customer. So I just want to keep that in the back of your mind. We're not going to hit on that a lot tonight, but you know, your, your mission, vision, and values for your team may have one focus, right? It's this, you, you're, you're trying to accomplish the same thing. Like you're trying to build a company, but that company needs to serve your team and it needs to serve your customer, right? So, and that's going to take a whole lot more explanation, but I just wanted you to, I wanted to introduce that concept. I didn't want to let that go by because admit what made me think about it was this next phase, people. Everyone always talks about, and, and it's true, that we need to look at our, we need to be, determine who our buyer, who our customer persona is um, as we are developing products because we want to serve them. We don't want to bring them to us and, and, and spend all our time, <clears throat> excuse me, get a little sip of water, and spend all of our time talking about ourselves. We want everything we do to be really centered around them. So that's what made me think of this. But to start, um, if you're creating an action plan for how you're going to get all this done, you have to think about it in terms of your team and in terms of the customer. And um, so first, with people creating an action plan for people, you got to create an action plan for how you're going to recruit your team. So recruiting is the first step. And recruiting your team and then quote unquote, kind of recruiting, which isn't the most accurate word, but how are you going to attract um, your customer? So you can see how that would work for both. But recruiting, I used to think and am barely, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm just now getting out of this mindset. I always felt like I didn't have enough money to pay a full-blown team. So until I had the money, it didn't make sense to try to recruit a team, right? which it's one of those chicken and egg situations, which comes first. And what, I, what I've started learning is you have, to, you have to set a vision for what it is you want in every area. If I say I'm going here and I'm building this multi-million dollar corporation, right, if that's my ultimate goal, in order for me to get there, I have to build a team. I cannot, um, I cannot build greatness beyond myself the way I, I've envisioned without a team. So I have to recruit a team. Sometimes recruiting kind of happens by osmosis, right? Like it happens organically as you are growing and, and doing what you do, your vision can a- attract people. Your gift, it's the word says, will bring you before great men. So as you, if it's bring, bringing you before great men, some of those great men are supposed to be helping you, right? They're supposed to be a part of your team. So um, recruitment can happen both ways. I mean, and there's really no linear path to it, but you can, you need to set a plan for how you're going to do that. How are you going to get people to work with you? How are you going to get the help that you need? And, and we talked many, many weeks ago about creating an organizational chart and a structure for your company. Don't think about it just in terms of what you can do by yourself. And don't wait until you have all the money, all the resources, all the clients, all that. You know, Noah built the ark before the, the, the flood came, before it even rained. And it, I think it talks about the Bible indicates it doesn't say a lot about the story, but it, it took 100 years, some ridiculous amount of time. And this man is still building. So planning i i liken it to building an ark planning for your company because you have to build something that does not exist that to solve a problem that you don't fully understand and and to be ready at to be a point of rescue and refreshing to people that you don't even know yet that you have you they don't and they don't know you right so it is a faith operation at every step of the way. You've got to believe in the power of your own vision, your own dream. And so you've got to start planning for what kinds of help. Like if you had help, if somebody came to you today and said, I want to help you, what would you have them do? What do you think would be the best way for them to step up and help you? And if you haven't even just thought about it a little bit, like if you had an assistant, 
what would an assistant do that could help really move you forward? What activities could you delegate to him or her so that you can be more productive? Okay, and you could just start there. Start simple with one thing, one person. If there was one person who could help you, what would they do? And you know what would be their primary role? And then you define that. Okay, so, but you got to create a plan for your people. How you're going to recruit your team, and then you know ultimately how you, uh, what kind of client you are working to serve, what kind of customer you're looking for, and then the next piece is training. You have to set once you have those people. How are you going to train them? If you have that one person, how would you train them? Oftentimes we say, like I've said many times, I needed a virtual assistant. And I thought, okay, if I get a virtual assistant, then that's going to save my life. But then once I started having people come to me who were available to help me, it was like, well, I, I didn't have anything. I had to make a plan for exactly what it is I needed them to do, you know? And of course it takes more time. It's so much easier for you to do it yourself because you know how to do everything. But if you keep doing everything all by yourself, you're not, you only have so much capacity. So you're, you're going to burn out. I mean, I love working. I love achieving. I love creating. I love, I just, I love everything about the process, but I have gotten so busy and have been pulled in so many directions lately in this stage of growth in my business that I'm going, oh, this is why I need help. And now I'm like, if I get a break, it's harder and harder for me to restart because I'm like, dang, I, I, I need, a, I need a, a, a rest from thinking so hard. And what happens is we, we kind of work ourselves into a, a hole, into a trap um, when we take on every single solitary role. I do believe that you should know how to do everything in your company so that you then can train the person that comes along who can take that off of your hands. So that way you're not, you're not at their mercy. You're also keeping your ownership and responsibility ultimately for the success of it. But you are then able to train this person effectively, not just tell them, Hey, this needs to be done and walk away. But where you can say, this is how I want to approach it. Honey, uh, Nedra, it's, it's easy to get in that hole. But the way you get out of the hole is you just start creating a plan. Okay, if I had somebody who could do A, B, C, and D, or just A and B, then I'll keep. I can keep doing this. I, I don't feel. I don't want you to feel like you you get somebody and you're just gonna dump everything on them and let them do it. Because if you get a good person, uh, you know the the you know the it, it, it would be easy to just kind of walk away and let them do it because then you feel comfortable. Oh, they can. But then you are getting putting them in the situation where they're going to end up in the exact same spot that you're in. If you're overwhelmed by everything you're doing now, you're going to put them in that same situation. And then they could one day just be, get over it and decide, oh, I'm, I'm leaving and they're gone. And now you're stuck again. So that doesn't solve the problem. You still have to be engaged. You know, when you delegate, they say you should inspect what you expect. And so when you are bringing somebody on to help you, there's going to be a, a season where it's a little extra work because maybe not a little, it'll probably, it might be a lot of extra work because you have to do your work and train them, but you have to train them. And that training is not just telling, but it's showing them, giving them an opportunity to do it, giving them feedback, answering their questions, creating a structure so that they can function and do well, right? Oftentimes we're not setting, setting up people who help us for success. So you have to do that. So you have to create a plan for how you're going to do that. How are you going to train the people? Now, let me go back. Recruiting doesn't mean you're hiring somebody full-time, that even that you're going to pay them as a full-time employee. It uh, Recruiting could be you're getting a, a freelancer from the internet, from all of these freelance sites that are out there. And you, you can find... Maybe you have to go through multiple people before you find someone that you feel like really helps you. Or you might have to find different people to do different things. So, But there's a way to get what you need done. But it has to start with you creating a plan for what it is exactly you need. And it's going to be trial and error. You're not like you can find somebody that's great and then all of a sudden they're not available anymore, especially in the freelance marketplace. That can be really challenging. But you can't let that stop you 
from finding somebody else. And I know we all want to get to some level of comfort where we don't feel like we're just always pushing and hustling and striving. But at the same time, as the owner, as the CEO, as the founder of your company, you have to understand that that's your responsibility is building your company. But you've got to get other people so that you can be in the role to build your company. If you got to do everything and you're trying to get people and you're trying to train them, like all of that, that'll wear you out ease quickly. But you have to create a plan so that you can start delegating, find the people that you can delegate to and creating some systems that'll that'll support everything. And I'll get into that a little bit more later. But so people, you've got to create an action plan for people and under that how you're going to recruit people to help you, how you're going to find them, identify them, then how you're going to train them. And you have to create an action plan for communication. How are you going to coordinate? Like for me, I have a a platform that I use for um, project management. I find it's so difficult to get people who don't use technology every day, you know, in a corporate setting in their business um, to, to engage with me in that system. But the reality is the larger the project or the more, um, the more moving parts you have to a a thing or longer, the process, longer, the time period, you have to have a way to communicate that that's more efficient than emails. Have you ever gotten involved with multiple people in a long email thread? You're trying to talk about something and, um, get feedback on a document or something. Oh, how painful is that? Oh my God. And then have you ever tried to go back to that thread to try to find something that you were, you, you, you were trying to get back to, right? That you, some reference or some specific point in that conversation that somebody brought up and you're trying to go back and find it. How do you do that? Because most people are not typing and adding subject lines in a way that's searchable. You may not remember exactly what the words are to search. How hard is that? Now, Having another system isn't going to necessarily solve all of those problems, but at least you have a, I like having a central way to communicate with people that I have to collaborate with over an extended period of time. But you had to just create a plan for how you're going to communicate. Do you want people to send you text messages? Do you want, is email enough for you? It, or do you want to use some other form? Would you prefer a phone call? Do, would you want to do in-person Zoom meetings? Do you want to do how do how are you going to communicate? Are you going to follow up with a Google Doc when you're finished? Like think you have to think through all those things. Otherwise, that's how things slip through the crack. You know, you, what is that that um, the the test they do the game you play where you get a long string of people and you start somebody says a sentence and they put it they whisper it in a person's ear and you go down the line and by the time you get down the line, that whole the sentence is totally jacked up. And the whole idea behind that is just because you have communicated something does not mean that you're, or attempted to communicate that your message has been received. Somebody could hear you, but they could interpret what you say differently than what you heard, what they say. And then you could say, well, do you understand? They'll say yes. You could say, does that make sense? Which I have a big habit of saying, but I'm always like, okay. I know I'm using a bunch of words, but does this make sense? And they could say, yes, it makes sense. But then when they go and try to do it later, it might not make sense anymore, <laughs> right? And that's just natural. That's what you call communication. This is what happens when people talk to each other, when people interact. So you have to create a plan for how you're going to follow up, how you're going to communicate, how you're going to make sure what it is you expect is actually what you're getting back. And maybe there was some flaw in how you communicated and that's why you didn't get back what you were expecting, you know? So, but you have to create some kind of structure around how you want to try to communicate. And it's going to take, you know, lots of adjustments because we're dealing with people. We're not machines, but even machines, when we use them, they don't necessarily always work well. And we are the ones inputting into the machine. So we may not be putting that information in accurately. So you just have to know You've got to create a way. How are we going to communicate about this? How do you want to get, do you want to be, um, see, uh, uh, you want to approve things before emails are sent out? Do you, do you want to have a process? Is there multiple people who could proofread? Do, Do you, do you want this person to write documents for you? Um, do you want them to write 
social media com content and do you care if they create their own graphics and you know all of those things how are you going to make sure your brand colors and messaging and all of that are carried out consistently you got to communicate and if you don't have a plan for how you're going to do that it's going to be very difficult for other people to come in and help you and uh, and work with you and then management and really management some people are really good at and some people are not and some that may, it may be something that you really like doing um but we have to learn how to do that as business owners without micromanaging. Have you ever had anybody stand over your shoulder? They tell you to do something, they stand over your shoulder and tell you how to do it. Or, you know, you drive it in your car and your husband is trying to tell you how to drive. I, I'm not talking about anybody in particular, but, um, but yeah. So have you ever been micromanaged and how does that feel? Right. You, nobody likes that, but you still have to manage. You still have to, Make sure that all the moving parts are working together. And as a business owner, you're responsible for that unless you delegate that to someone else who is functioning as your manager. But then even that person, you have to manage. You can't just leave them hanging. You can't just let them define everything all by themselves. But you also don't want to be over them like a hawk, watching their every move and taking, you know, I, I am a very particular person. I see things very, you know, certain way. Um, and I'm always making new connections and making changes. And I, I can see the big picture. And I also see that there's an extra space in between those two words, right? Like I, I'm just that type of person. And I know that there is an opportunity for me to make other people feel like that what they're doing is never good enough. And, you know, that I'm really picky or whatever. And, and I'm trying, I know that about myself. So I try my best to communicate as clearly as possible to help let people know I really appreciate them. I try to give them an opportunity to make changes to things. But I know that, I just know that about me because of the way I think and how I function, that I could have that impact on people. But that doesn't mean that I, I have, I can, just let go of all responsibility for trying to manage them and trying to provide direction to get to the result that I want. And the result that I want is ultimate quality. I want to serve the client. I want to be able to fulfill our mission. So that's my ultimate desire. And I want to create an environment where my team can th then thrive and they can flourish and they want to be there. We all having fun and we're making money and we're growing and we're changing and all of that. But all of that creates friction, right? There's no way for it to all go perfectly, but I'm doing everything I can as the as a manager, no matter who it is I'm dealing with, trying to communicate with them as best as I probably possibly can and not abdicate my role and my responsibility for bring helping to bring about the ultimate you know, the ultimate thing that we're looking for that I'm trying to accomplish that we're trying to accomplish as a team. So you have to create an action plan for your people. Okay. And, um, and I knew it. So I'm going to, I'll probably touch on product and then we'll maybe, I don't know if I'll get to, through it, through it very well. Maybe we'll pick up next week and do some more about that. But, um, I wanted, so let me, but let me at least introduce this because this was what we were, we started talking about creating your brand architecture. You have to create a plan for your product and you, you are a product all by yourself, but then you should also create products. And, and I say products, you know, now we hear a lot about people creating courses, um, doing uh, Facebook groups, membership programs, in-person events, um, webinars, you know, pre-recorded webinars, like we're do, writing a book, doing a workbook, creating a journal, like we're, we're hearing all the time about that. But the reality is that if you are a brand, if you, and if you have a company, that company needs to have a, a broad spectrum of products that you you include in your brand architecture. You have to define how these things relate to each other. As Gwen Witherspoon Coach, I am the host of Vivid Talk Live, but Vivid Talk Live is part of a, a whole suite of of interactive platforms designed for the personal and, and professional development of entrepreneurs. So it, it Vivid Talk Live at one at some point is gonna kind of be on its own. It's gonna I'm gonna throw it out of the nest and it's gonna fly on its own. Even though I'm still I'll be the host probably still, 
but it'll be, it'll have it'll, a life of its own somewhere else. But right now, it's part of the Gwen Witherspoon Coach brand architecture and included on my website. And then I have Flip Productivity, a series of tools, a printed planner as the core, and a and a, a series of accessories, a suite of accessories that use that you can use to help you be more productive. And then I have you know, so I mean I can go on and on, but you need to do the same thing. And so your a blog, a vlog, a, your video, all those things are part of that architecture. And I need you to define that. So you want to create an action plan for your products. So I want to talk about there's four issues to consider. One is um, positioning. And we always we even talk about you. I know you've heard this about writing a positioning statement for your business. Um, we talk about doing market research and analyzing competitors and all those things. I used to get so intimidated by all of that, right? And But now what I'm recognizing is you have to do it first and foremost. You got to say, okay, how does what you are doing differ from all the other people? I talked last week, looking out into ant, doing analysis in the marketplace is really about seeing what everybody is doing and pick, you can pick and choose. You don't have to like copy anybody specific, but look for the qualities, the things that you see they're doing well that really speak to you, that make your soul sing, that you can incorporate into what you are doing. And then you also want to look because you want to see where are their gaps? Where do I want to be? I had a, a, I was talking to a, an entrepreneur a while ago and um, he said that uh, he looked at um, the transportation marketplace. You know, we have all these opportunities now to do Uber and Lyft, and I'm sure there's other services that have popped up. We have taxis, we have the bus, we have all these different ways that we can be transported. And they are all, um, they're all fighting to have the most competitive price. And he looked at all of that and decided, you know what? I'm not going to go for all of that. Like, I'm not going to compete on price. I'm not going to do this, you know, the average consumer. I'm going after the high market. I'm going after the people that need private cars and that are going to pay a lot more money for that. And so that was his, he decided that's how he was going to position his business. You got to think about your business the same way. How are you positioned? And you might position yourself right next to somebody that's doing almost exactly the same thing and then compete with them on price or better service or, you know, whatever. But you've got to create a plan for how you're going to position. I am always trying to position myself in the luxury area. I don't like anything cheap. I don't like anything tacky. I, don't, I want everything to be really high quality and well done and beautiful and all of those things. So you might be the same way, but then don't miss out on the opportunity maybe to create a sub brand that's a lower price. So we've done that with Adam Red. Adam Red is a full service branding agency. What we want to do is, is we want to serve those clients that need so a team of people to work on their behalf to build and grow multi-million dollar brands because they don't have the time to sit there and do everything by themselves or clients that need a personal brand to that they want to grow to a multi-million dollar company we want to set them up so that they have what they need so that they have the foundation they need for growth but then I'm always running into people that just got a hot side hustle or maybe totally just starting up. And I have a heart. I want to help everybody. So what we did was we created Spread Digital, which is a sub brand. It's not better. It's not worse. It's just a brand that's been positioned to help people at an earlier stage of development in their business. And it gives us a way to help everybody. But I can't help everybody through the Adam Red brand because everybody doesn't have the money to pay a team of four or five, six people to work for their, you know, for their business. Um, and so th you may be in that same situation. You can create a product specifically for a, a certain demographic of people. And if you can do that well and you can make money on it, psh, why not? And you really, people, we, we always talk about telling people that you don't do too many things. I think if you have limited resources and you don't have a whole lot of money and you're just starting out, you don't know what you're doing and you're just developing your team, like there's so many different components to building a business that, yeah, you want to focus. But I think first and foremost, you want to focus on who you are as a brand and then you start developing and building from there. But you got to think about where you are. How are you positioned? How are you positioned in the marketplace among all the choices that are out there? 
And, you know, there's a concept called blue ocean strategy where you want to create not just um, go where everybody else is going, but you create, you find a place in the ocean, right? Wait, you think about the vastness of the ocean. You want to find a space that nobody's in at all. You, you might be able to do that. That, but either way, that's still about positioning. How are you going to position yourself? And then pricing, competition. I've been talking forever. I'm going to shut it down. So pricing, competition, and sales. We're going to talk about that next week. Your how you're going to price your product. We all all struggle with that. Um, what does the competition look like, and how you're actually going to sell it? So once again, I want you to um, go to GwenWitherspoon.com to get all the information. Oh, that's the replays. Um, you can see everything there. Watch all the replays every week. I put the last week's episode here on that homepage, make it easy. And we got so many that we had to move the replays over to an, it, their own page. Make sure that you are following uh, at Gwen Fuchs. Wait, it doesn't want to switch. There we go. At Gwen Fuchs on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Periscope. And Gwen with a Spoon Coach on YouTube. And I will see you next week. Make sure you tell somebody about um, Vivid Talk Live. We are here every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And um, it's just it's just my delight to help you to really learn a fresh way of thinking for all you were designed to build. See you next week. Bye.